Okay, then. So the Duratus Mind podcast today welcomes Dinger Bell. Dinger, welcome. Hi, mate. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Um, no, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure, mate. Um, every single episode, I get to pick and choose who I talk to, and this is why I'm doing it. I, I've lost track of the number of friends of ours that have messaged me that have said, you've got to get Dinger on, you've got to get Dinger on. And uh, finally, it's happened. I thought it wasn't going to happen. I've not told you this even yet, that just before we started, I've had serious internet problems and and the first world problems, I'm sure, compared to what you're going to be faced with in the next few weeks. But uh, um, yeah, this is it's, it's get a chance to talk now, mate, and I'm mega looking forward to it. So thanks for coming along. No, it's my pleasure. Awesome. Um, probably worth for people listening, just um, relating our connections. We've got, you know, uh, both of us with a, a military background and, you know, our paths have crossed a number of times. We've never worked alongside each other jointly, but people like Foxy, people like Del Ashley, we've just been chatting about um, some of the stuff that you're getting up to now. People are going to, they're going to have their minds blown, mate. And I'm keen to leverage uh, our connections to to try and get this out there and, and try and raise as much money for what you're about to do as possible so is it worth thing are you just for those that um, may know of what you're doing I've shared it a little bit I know others have and for those that haven't do you mind just giving us a bit of an overview of what the blazes you've got yourself into <laughs> yeah I'm certainly bitten off more than I can chew this time that's for sure um yeah I'm hoping uh we're looking forward at weather to the weekend uh, and I'm hoping by Saturday, Sunday, if the forecast is correct and the window does develop as we hope it does, uh, I'm going to row out of New York in a 7.6 metre one man um, ocean rowing boat. And I'm going to try and row it back to Falmouth in the UK. So that's across the North Atlantic. Uh, it's about um, point to point. If you just do it on a, you know, on a, on a GPS or some, some, you know, navigation software, it's about 3,100 and something miles. Um, but obviously I'm going to be going backwards and round in circles and all over the place. So I'll, I'll no doubt do a lot more than that. But you, you say obviously, because this is something you've thought a lot about and you, you understand the, the complications here. So when I first hear about like genuinely, mate, if I, if I first hear about uh, Atlantic rowing, I'm like, yeah, Fox has done that. I know a few people that have done it actually. And I, you know, yeah, you, you're doing it solo, which I think that's got to be nails. Um, but what there's a few intricate differences between what you're trying to do and what anyone else I know that's uh, done before. And actually, am I right in saying that this, this is possibly a world first? Um, it's yes, it's, it's being, it's being um, talked up, if you like, as a world first. It, so the North Atlantic route that I'm doing is referred to as the classic, uh, the classic route. So it's New York, technically it's to the Scilly Isles. I'm going into Falmouth because that little bit's, that's just liaison. It makes me turn the boat, boat home <laughs> a lot easier and it's an extra 40 miles. So I thought, well, I might as well just, you know, carry on past the Scillies. Um, but it's called the classic route because it was the first time that anybody ever rowed any ocean. Uh, it was two Norwegian fishermen, you testing me on dates now. I think it was 1894 or 1896, uh, something like that. Um, I've done it already, Cass. Put me back onto your original question. Um, what makes yours? Just, what's different? What's different to yes, this? Yeah. The normal route, if you want to call it that. I mean, there's nothing particularly normal about rowing an ocean. Uh, it's a very, very small group of people that want to do it. But generally, people go across the mid mid Atlantic. So there's a, a brilliant event called the uh, the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge. Yep. Um, people call call it Twack for short, and that goes out of the Canary Islands. Did I hear that right? <laughs> Twack <laughs> or Twack if you don't want to settle quite so closely to the wind with it. Um, yeah, and and so that goes out of the Canaries every year in about December uh, and goes over to the Caribbean. It's a fantastic event. Um, and actually, when I first started looking at a row, that was the event I, I looked into. But it's a race for a start, which, you know, I'm, I'm old and broken and I didn't particularly want to race it is one thing. The, the, what I'm doing isn't about, you know, being the first or anything like that. Um, it's also expensive to enter. And if you do enter, you, you, you kind of need to have... Um, a Rannoch boat, which we might talk about a little bit later, but they're quite expensive. They're, they're a lot more cutting edge than my boat, so they're a lot more expensive. 
So that put me off the Talisker, uh, the Talisker race. Yeah. yeah, an independent road does generally end up being a lot cheaper, but I have spent my life savings on this. Yeah, well, I don't <laughs> so, doubt that. Uh, what I'm hearing from the, the other Talisker race, it's, it's east to west. It's much more temperate versus, uh, you know, you're not you're not going to be faced with the kindest of weathers. That's that's for certain, right? I mean, what kind of conditions is best for you? Um, well, well, that route that I'm talking about, the Mid Atlantic route, is um, it has much more consistent weather systems. Um, so generally, that means uh, wind and swell from behind and it, it helps you across. There, there's no two ways about that. And, and there are trade winds in the North Atlantic as well, but they're just, they're not as strong and they're not as consistent. And you've also got a thing that comes down from the North, from the Arctic called the Labrador Current. So you have the, the, the warmer equatorial waters coming up the Eastern coast of the US, uh, bends round past New York, um, uh, across the New Newfoundland. And then it mixes with this Labrador Current, which gives you some really horrible unstable weather uh, so you have confused seas uh, lots of if it's calm or, or, or very often when it's calmer you get lots of really really dense sea fog out there because you've got warm water being pushed up from the equator mixing with freezing cold or very cold water uh, coming down on the labrador current um, so it, it it's 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 just a big melting pot of lots of different conflicting weather patterns of which i know you know a, a I know a very surface level uh, about that. Um, but really, that, that was part of the attraction for me, choosing that route. Yeah, well, that was, that was my next question. You know, um, there's going to be a lot of people thinking about Atlantic rowing and what that might mean for them. And they go, why pick the hard one, right? So, so what, what is that? What is that why for you? What is the why? Um, the most common question and the hardest to answer. Uh, as... as as concisely as I can put it, Gaz, it, it's just to see if I can. It, it's a curiosity to see if I can. Um, and I think in answering that question, if I tell you some reasons that don't motivate me, it will help you understand what, what, what does. Uh, I'm not interested in um, records. Uh, as I've already said, it's not about blasting across there as quick as I can. It's about the journey for me. It's about what happens when I leave. New York and before I arrive uh, in Falmouth. Um, I in no way, shape or form am, am aiming for a record, although I might establish um, a, a solo and unsupported first uh, to, to answer your previous question. Uh, it has been road solo before, but never unsupported. So to do solo unsupported, it, it could be, be, be deemed as a first. Um, so my why is to see if I can. Um, if I just wanted to go down the pub and raise a beer and big myself up and say, I've rode an ocean, I, I, I can jump in a crew of four and do the mid-Atlantic route, rip across there in 30 to 40 days, and I've got all the bragging rights I need. Um, the North Atlantic, basically, I've got about a 30% chance of success of getting across. Uh, so you have to consider failure. Um, but all of that to me just, and I don't know whether I'm just wired up wrong, that makes it more attractive to me, not less. No, that, I, that, that, that makes it more worthwhile. No, I, I absolutely get it, mate. You, you're right in that you're wired up wrong, just for starters. Um, there's, <laughs> um, that, I, I know a lot of people that are wired up. I actually choose to speak to people that are wired up on the, on the face of it wrong because I... You know, there's a lot of people that would listen to that and go, I, I just don't get it. And I do get it, mate. I do get why you would want to do that. I talk to people about uh, navigating uncertainty and actually getting practice at navigating uncertainty. I, I, I'm talking about it hypothetically, of course, but you're you're dealing with it now quite literally. And there's going to be an awful lot of uncertainty that you're going to have to be navigating from the swells to the winds, to the currents, to the other shipping lanes. I mean, I'm, I'm curious as to the training that you've put into this and I'm not logistics wise and kind of sea survival stuff, but more physically, what kind of, how on earth do you prepare for something like this? <laughs> My answer might surprise you guys. Uh, I've done nothing. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 don't get me wrong. I, I'm not arrogant enough to think that I don't need to train. Um, 
I would be much happier if I had uh, managed to, to set down a, a training program and stick to it physically. I, I don't actually think that you need to be super fit to do this. Um, you, it, it's absolutely more of a mental game. Uh, and, and the only people that really understand that are maybe if guys have done some, you know, some tough military style training where it takes you beyond physicality into the realms of, you know, where your strength of mind comes in. Um, it, I, um, I would have <laughs> sincerely loved to have done a training program. However, COVID just wrecked my plans. Um, it, I, I was in... Uh, I, I call it fat camp in Thailand. I, I've done it a couple of times. Uh, they're brilliant things to go and do. I love it. it, it it's it, if you imagine a cross between an all-inclusive hotel and a gym. So you, you turn up there. They um, look at what kind of a specimen you are. Do some simple tests with you. Give you a baseline. Ask you what you're there for and what you want to achieve. So a lot of people go there to lose weight. Everybody wants abs. So I was there for eight weeks. I was I was booked in for eight weeks. And I was doing that, um, is it March, April time for two months? And then I planned to go back and do another two months, December and January. And through the summer, I'd be coastal rowing. So actually learning to row, learning some rowing technique to bridge the gap between those two really, really focused periods of training. And the idea was by going away, you, 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 I have no other focus, nothing other than training physically uh, you know and i'm a little bit older i'm 49 i'll have my 49th birthday middle of june uh, so hopefully i'll be on my way when i have my 49th birthday so i'm no spring chicken i've had some knocks uh, i'm a dirt biker so i've you know bashed my knees around and i've bashed my shoulders around and stuff like that so a lot of my training was to do with becoming robust uh, you know getting my injuries as good as they can be classic boot neck back and knees and hips and ankles all of that stuff's all going on um so it was it was about getting my body as good as I, it could be um getting a bit fitter and a bit stronger um and then covid hit and it all went to it all went to a ball of chalk exactly. so, so I, I i flew out of bangkok on i believe i'm right in saying this i definitely got the third from last seat and I believe I was on the second to last BA flight out of Bangkok because um, the planet was just shutting down right at the beginning of the pandemic. So I made it home by the skin of my teeth. I'd probably still be there if I hadn't have got that flight. <laughs> Mate, what you've just said um, regards to your training and preparation for this or lack of um, people will blow people's minds. I, I do get it. Um, it's hard for me. I've, I've, I've not spent a single moment of my life in, a, in an ocean going rowing boat. So I've got no context there. But, you know, the things you're saying, you've, your preparation has been in the years of pushing yourself. And, and we would know it as physical, but even still, never in a competitive way, just constantly finding new ways to learn more about yourself from you know, from being a, a lad, I understand you grew up in Nottingham, Derby. So, you know, yeah. we, you know oh, okay. I'm, I'm not far oh, away from you at all. And, um, you know, there was no real understandable reason why I joined the Marines. It, it was actually, well, that's a massive challenge. I wouldn't mind going and seeing if I could do that with zero expectation that I ever would. And, and that pretty much is the story of my career. You know, there's very little planning involved, but there was always kind of these big chunks of challenge that I saw that's attractive to me because I don't know if I can do that. Now, I hear that and I, I, I do my best to try and communicate people of saying this is navigating uncertainty, go and try it. And you might be surprised if you've got a compelling enough reason why you're doing it. And again, I've attached compelling reasons to the things that I've done in my past, but give us an, as an insight into the, well, you just want to see if you can, which is, huge i get it but there's there's got to be a bigger pull than that and i'm aware that there's a few charities that you're 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 pushing for and, and keen to promote in this um yeah so there's um there's two charities one is the sbs association and the second one is rock to recovery uh so the the sbs association comes in through my uh 
friendship with a guy called Toby Gutteridge. Uh, I'm actually, I don't know if you can see that. I'm wearing his T-shirt at the minute. To uh, Toby's so been on the pod. Toby's been on the pod and okay. his podcast landed unbelievably well. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Toby's a, you know, he's a, a young guy. I think he's early 30s now. I believe he was shot 10 or 11 years ago. Um, so he, he joined the Royal Marines. He came over from South Africa, joined the Royal Marines, and then um, passed the course and, and went SBS. Um, I, I met Toby at my local dirt bike circuit when he, he came to, to shoot some video footage to help launch the Bravery brand. So that's why I first came across Toby, and that was probably three or four years ago now. Um, so I've, I've helped him a little bit with uh, some of his trade stands, you know, just to be an extra pair of hands for him and, and talking to members of the public about bravery and what it is. Um, I think Toby's inspirational. Um, right. I, I, um, I'm, I'm doing my best through my row. You know, I'm doing my row for my own reasons, but it's nice to be able to help Toby on the back of it. Um, so it's about just park that to one side briefly. Um, there's also a, a, the obvious charity for, for me to raise money for would be um, the, the Royal Marines charity. But there's a crew of four here called Ocean Revival who already have a very big campaign and they're already raising money for, for the Royal Marines charity. Um, they should have rode out um, this time last year, but COVID scuppered that. So they're, they're like 18 months older and further down the line than me. They've already hoovered up about 50 grand's worth of donations. And if I am just another Royal Marine doing the same route at the same time, um, raising money for the same charity, I'm appealing to the same demographic. Um, and, you know, bearing in mind that, you know, 98 odd percent of, of the SBS are Royal Marines, I thought, well, that's quite a good fit. Um, so the SBS Association are instrumental in Toby's continued care. Agreed, yeah. Um, so, so uh, you know, that, that's, um, uh, that's where the idea came from. Uh, and then Rock to Recovery, <laughs> that, that was quite a, it's this brotherhood thing. You know, I, I have an old friend of mine, uh, a, a mutual friend, sorry, uh, Dell. Um, I, I reached out, I knew Dell in Scotland. I haven't spoken to him for 20 odd years reached out to him because he now works in maritime satellite communications. I said, can you help me? Uh, I'm, I'm doing this row. And he said, yep, I can lend you all your kit. The last person to use that kit was Jason Fox, none other than. So, so it's, probably, <laughs> it's probably broken then? It's probably broken, yeah, <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> probably way too complicated for Jason to be able to use it. <laughs> so uh, he's going to fill me in when he sees me. Um, so, so I then get given Jason's contact details, meet Jason. I tell him that I've, you know, I, I, I've met Toby and they're mutual friends. Jason was involved. He was on the ground when Toby was shot. So they're obviously, they're, they're, they're linked and they're joined by that event, you know. And, and so um, as soon as I said I was raising money for the SBS Association, Jason turned around because he's obviously done a row as well, Team Essence, and he said, have you got a weather router to the answer? Uh, and the answer to that at the time was no. Um, Jason's old man goes by the nickname Silver and is a lifelong sailor and um, is performing. Um, uh, he's going to be my weather router. He's performing the duties of, of, uh, of weather router for me. But Jason's going to pay for it for me. So um, and that's Jason's way of helping the association. So in return to that, because I know that. Um, Jason founded Rock to Recovery, uh, and what I what I really like about Rock to Recovery is it. it I, I wanted to do something for the civilian sector as well for civilian mental health. We've had an epic year last year. Yes, veterans' causes are very close to my heart as a veteran, but it. I wanted something that would that would recognise that there's other people out there struggling as well and appeal to a, a different section of society. Uh, and Rock to Recovery extends its services out to blue light workers as well, um, which I, you know, that was a big, a, a big part in wanting to support it. And as a thank you to Jason for helping me with his, you know, with the weather router, because yeah, that's a, a good few thousand pounds worth of, um, of services that, that Jason's paying for, you know, on yeah. my behalf. Yeah, massive shout out to Team Fox, um, especially getting the Silver Fox involved. Uh, I remember re uh, seeing his updates 
when when Foxy was rowing across as well. So yeah, no, brilliant, mate. I, I love that, and it's certainly a lot to be said for the the brotherhood, like you're saying, um, getting as many people involved. And there, there's I know there's been no lack of support um, in the last few days and weeks, whilst you know you've come over a few humps. Um, we spoke previously about you know your willingness or desire to to just go and challenge yourself. Where where do you think that stems from, Ding? What, what's the have you always been a bit like that? This is what people are trying to understand. Of, of I, the, the technical term is outliers. We, we spoke earlier about people that are wired up wrong, right? We're, we're outliers, that these people that grab these challenges that most people wouldn't dream of. Um, if, is that always something that you've had that's inside you, or is it something you've developed and fostered throughout your kind of career? Um, I, I was laughing as you were asking me the question there because... I- I think a big part of that was actually came from the air cadets, which is really embarrassing to uh, <laughs> to admit. Um, Talking about I, I, think I, <laughs> I, I think the idea of, of challenging myself really did genuinely come from. I joined the air cadets at the age of the thirteen. I always wanted to be a pilot. I'm a failed pilot. Um, I, I, I failed the medical, and my brain is way too small as well to be a pilot. Um, so I blame it on failing the medical, uh, yeah. but I was also quite stupid. Uh, at school and uh, I was quite naughty at school uh, as well I had a bad I had a bad few years um, while I was at school but the uh, the, the air cadets taught me uh, this is embarrassing because I know this is going to go public but um, you've got to you know I'm a young lad and I was being naughty at school Uh, my parents were divorcing and I'm not blaming um, the divorce in any way shape or form in hindsight I think it was a really bizarrely positive um, thing to go through uh, that divorce because it taught me that I was in control of my own destiny and I managed to change it so I I stopped being such a dick at school um, uh, and reined my behavior in uh, mainly because I was presented with my very own social worker at one point so so beyond beyond just the family nagging me you know my parents and my grandparents it was like official recognition that my behavior was just it gone too far. Um, never outrageously bad, but just constantly disruptive. Uh, you know, just uh, probably the same as I am now, to be honest with you. But I can't take much seriously. But so I, I, I was having a difficult time at school. Um, but with the air cadets, um, you have to show commitment. You've got to parade. You parade it twice, twice a week. You've got to have a uniform on. Don't forget, thirteen years old, and I'm a bit naughty and, and turning into a bit of a rogue. Um, you, you turn up in your uniform, you've got to iron your trousers, iron your shirt, you've got to keep yourself presentable, uh, you've got to stand on parade, you've got to not fidget, stand still, you, you know, have respect for this, this rank structure. Um, and I mean, I couldn't stand all of that. That was purgatory for me. But in, in return, at the weekends, you get to do all of this really cool stuff. Um, I, I, I'm trying to think of some of the things I did. I was, I was captain of the East Midlands shooting team. I learned more about marksmanship in the air cadets than I ever did in the Marines, mate. And I mean that, absolutely. Because it, it was in the days of Bisley, um, you know, when Bisley was, okay. was still going. And one of our uh, civilian instructors was an ex-Bisley marksman. So, so he taught me loads about shooting. It, it was brilliant. Um, I was out um, hiking and backpacking with them all the time. You'd go flying two or three times a year. So you'd get half an hour of just belt fed aerobatics, which for a 13, 14 year old kid who wanted to be an Air Force pilot was just, you know, I lived for those half an hour, um, you know, experiences, if you like, throughout each year, two annual camps a year. Um, and it, I lived for it. You know, I was out doing something almost every weekend. Um, but to get that, you've got to put up with the, the nonsense standing on parade and, you know, silly knees bent marching around. Uh, so, so, but those activities are where I started, like you've mentioned, an outlier. I think that's where I started. I hit upon the idea of, I heard somewhere that you can do a parachute jump. So I'm like, well, I want to do a parachute jump. I was only 15 at the time. So I was on the phone. It was is it Langer Airfield in the Midlands? I think it was Langer or Langley. Is it Langer or Langley? I, can't I think remember. it's Langley. Yeah. So I was phoning up saying, I want to come and do some parachuting. And they're like, does your mum know you're on the phone? Uh, uh, and, and they explained to me I had to be 16 and I had to have, you know, 
parental consent and all the rest of it. So at the age of 16, I, was, I, did, I did my first two or three parachute jumps, just static line stuff. But so many people were telling me that that was, that I was crazy to, to want, you know, why would you want to do that? And, you know, I was still fairly young, but I think that's the first flicker of where I started to want to do things that weren't mainstream. The fact that people had doubted me and questioned me and I went and did it, so those very early seeds, although a static line parachute is that big a deal, for such a youngster, I think it's... So, Dinger, part three, we've had a few technical issues. Um, I'm dressed different. It's a different day. It's not Hollywood. Continuity police would have me, but uh, I'm really appreci genuinely appreciative, mate, of you coming back on and, and uh, us getting a chance to talk this, because I was... I was thoroughly enthused by, you know, invigorated by what you were saying. So you you mentioned towards the end where it started to break up about how, you know, you joined the cadets and you were young when you did it, and there was things that attracted you. Want to be a pilot? Probably watched too much Top Gun uh, as a young as a young man. And, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know I had. Uh, I've got way too many white t shirts tight white t shirts upstairs. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you joined the cadets, and that whilst that you, your words, there was a lot of nonsense in the cadets. It, gave you a number of experiences that you probably couldn't have got anywhere else like parachuting like maybe going up in planes. do you want to elaborate on that and how later on in your life that's kind of continued to happen that you've used those experiences um yeah it was like i said it was the word that i picked up on the word that you used um outlier um mm. and, and through the cadets i started experiencing those things that a lot of other people weren't. Um, you know, I mentioned the parachuting. I, I wanted to do that when I was 15. Legally, I had to wait until I was 16. Um, I soloed in a, in a glider when I was uh, 16 years old before I could drive a car, which, again, for a young lad is, is quite something, and especially for a young lad who wants to be a pilot. Yeah, you know, they, they, they had me hook, line, and sinker. Um, so the, the discipline is something that you have to swallow to be able to get to the exciting stuff. Um, in, in one of your earlier questions, going back to what was yesterday now for both of us, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, your reasons for joining the court. I, I fell into joining the court. Um, like I say, I wanted to be a pilot. I, I, um, I was having trouble at school. I, I think my frustration with my parents' divorce was playing out at school. Uh, but my focus for my career was coming from the air cadet side of things, wanting to be a pilot. Um, and then um, I failed the medical. I, I don't know how much of this came out, so just if it repeats itself, guys, I apologise. Yeah. But um, I failed the medical. Um, so I had the rug pulled out of me uh, altogether with the flying side of things. Um, so the one option I had, I managed to claw a little bit of my... Um, education back. I did manage to get a couple of A-levels because that's what I needed to be a pilot. Um, so I reined my behavior in at school, which um, that, that's kind of why um, it's why I think my parents' divorce was actually quite positive because it, it, it made me realize I could, I could change my behavior and control my own path in life. And I think that was really poignant for me, uh, a really Although it was unpleasant going through that process, it, it made me realize I had control. Um, so I had a couple of A-levels. I'd been offered a place at Loughborough University doing industrial design. Um, and I just, I, you know, I was just this idiot kid at school who used to stare out the window, um, just wanting to go and run around the athletics track or, you know, sports and PEs, the only thing that I was passionate about. Um, so the, the, the idea of doing industrial design filled me with dread. Um, and there was a, a, a lad in the upper six who was applying to join the Marines. Um, and he went down and he passed. So I just thought, I'm going to have a go at that. It, it, and it was literally a whim, an absolute whim. Um, uh, and I never thought I'd pass. And I, I think you, you might be thinking I'm going slightly left. Hopefully I'll bring it back onto your question. Um, I. I, I did literally overnight just think, well, I'm just going to join the Marines and see how far I can get through basic training. Uh, and it was literally that. I had no how idea. Old, how old were you then, Digger? I was 18 when I started basic training and I turned 19 while I was down at Limston. Yep. Um, so I'd finished my A-levels, upper sixth. Um, 
turn down the idea of university. I knew I couldn't spend any more time at school. I, I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't the right mentality. I just wanted to run around hills and carry heavy things. <laughs> so the Marines seemed like the perfect, uh, perfect fit for that. So I, I went to join the Marines not expecting to pass. And I think this comes, this is where hopefully my explanation brings me back on, being an outlier. I, I, I had no fear of failure because <laughs> bizarrely I expected to fail. Um, I didn't think I was made of the right kind of metal to be a Royal Marine. Uh, so 30 weeks later, when I was stood on the parade school out of the pen, getting my green berry, uh, as a King's Badgeman, wow. <laughs> there's only two people in the world, Buzz. <laughs> those people are King's Badgeman and those who aren't. Um, so I've come clean about air cadets, so I might as well I, make that. I, of, I officially am not, so uh, I don't qualify. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so nobody was more surprised than me. Um, and so, I, I, again, it was, a, it was through that process of not expecting to pass, it made me realize that actually maybe I am capable of more than I think. Um, and, and so I, I give you another classic example. Two years later, I, I applied to join uh, Recce Troop. The, the first six month deployment I did in the Marines was to Belize in 93. Okay. So I, I was on, on completion of training, I was posted to Zulu Company. Um, and we deployed to, to, um, uh, to Belize. And at the end of the Belize tour uh, was a was a recce troop selection, and I was just I was doing as many patrols as I could while I was out there. I, I've got so many fond memories of that uh, of that tour. It was a fantastic place to be, you know, young lad out in the jungle, honking dirty jungle. Oh. Um, I don't know if you've been, but yeah. just fertile ants just chasing you around everywhere, um, which has got these massively poisonous, aggressive territorial snakes for, for listeners that don't know what a fertile ants is. Um, and um, yeah, I, I thought, well, I'm, I'm just going to put in for recce troop selection. And I can remember the people around me. And this was this process that started at school with, with, with my parents saying you shouldn't be parachuting or you shouldn't be walking the Pennine Way. Then it was these, these older guys, these older sweats in Zulu company saying, you're a sprog, you've only done two years. You know, you've got to do seven, eight, nine years before you apply to join uh, recce troop. And, I, and my attitude was, well, well, yeah, but I, it's just, it's just for fun, you know. It's, it's just it'll give me something to focus on, give me something to train for. Um, and my God, the hardest two weeks of my life because uh, of the heat out there. We got absolutely, uh, absolutely hammered. It was ran by a bunch of guys who ended up going on selection. So at the end of Belize, they were all going on selection. So they used that tour mm-hmm. to just turn themselves into superhumans <laughs> with the fizz they were doing. And then we turned up, uh, and they absolutely thrashed us. It, it was an epic two weeks, and there was four places, and I came fourth. So again, it was a, a you know, and to get into recce troopers as a two-year-old marine was not unheard of. I'm not saying I was a trailblazer, but I was young for sure. Yeah, there are mm-hmm. other examples of it, but um, it certainly went against the grain. No. Um, so, so that's. I was just going to just going to say on that dinger. It's such a common story. I, I've chatted about this with a few people, and um, what your you know you going into the Marines, your your whole network um, around you was probably doubting that you could do it, it's shaping that opinion that you've had of you probably couldn't do it. I was in the same boat, you know. No, no, I didn't expect to be able to be successful. And then um, your time in the Marines, you know, you you learn a lot from that experience. You went, wow, actually, that surprised me. I, I didn't, I did much better than I thought I could. You learn from that, and then you go, well, you know, I'd really like to go into recce troop. And then you're nudging against other people's fears that have never managed to get there, and they go, well, you're not senior enough. You've got to wait a few years because if you go and be successful, then why haven't they? And this is one of the things that we see time and time again with the people that keep wiggling to the top of their particular field, whether it's military or whether it's sport. Or whether it's a business that they just gone do you know what i don't actually i'm not going to concern myself with what the other people say this feels right and i'm going to give it a go and get that feedback you just seem to be i'm, I'm smiling because i know the feedback that you're about to get for the next few months but um, you're, you're you're just someone that obviously is happy to go and get feedback and learn more about yourself yeah 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 absolutely so um and you know that 
I think they're too, they were obviously very early in my career. Um, but I think because they were early in my life and my career, I, I think they were a lot more poignant, you know, and, and, and as, as you go through, <clears throat> excuse me, the next 20 years, um, you know, there's, there's other, there's other examples of that. So mm, it, it, uh, it just made me realize that, you know, what is, uh, and I'm doing this with the row now, definitely. Um, I, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but nope. you know, what is the actual consequence of failure? Um, you know, my row, it has been rowed solo before, but the guy took a resupply, so he lost the unsupported accolade. Um, but this route has only ever been rowed once before solo. If I can do it solo unsupported, if I wanted to big it up, it could be a world first. I don't like that. You know, if I need a resupply, I'll take one. And I'm taking nothing away from the guy that, that, that rode this route Um uh, it, you know, it was in 2005, a guy called Ollie Hicks, and he deserves all the credit, um, you know, but, but the chances of failure for me are very, very high. But, you know, what, what's the consequence other than a bit of a ripping down the pub? That is it. That's the sum well, total, and the fact I've spent my life savings, but that's, well, that's, you know, I'm prepared to do that because the rewards are, are, will be phenomenal. Well, I, I see what you're saying. Okay. So I, I do, I do agree with you on some level, you know, it's like you're, you know, what, like, um, pers personally, you know, what's the risk to, well, it's like you say, it's a bit of a ribbon down, uh, with your mates. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening here, Dinger, you know, you've got a lot of experience at sea, um, or a fair amount of experience at sea. There's a lot of people going, I can think of bigger risks than a ribbing down the pub from what you're about to take off. So how we, so one, I did put out a question or a question to people on social media to, and I've got a few at the end, but just because it's in line with what we're talking about. So, right. You've, you've met, you've chosen to just ignore a dozen or so massive risks, consequences that you just, going to park there and can we unpick yeah. that a little bit i don't you know if you're not happy to i'm, I'm to protect no, you, but, you know, how, what, you know yeah. let, let's let's just say let's just say there's going to be some big waves let's just say you get capsized let's just say billy no mate sinks right so you know that isn't beyond my kind of perception of you know what you know how are you reasoning that yourself how are you dealing with that fear mate? yeah I, I think maybe what i um I, I, maybe what i said um I didn't explain particularly well. Um, so what, what you're talking about are the, 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 the physical risks to what I'm doing um, and the physical risks associated with um, a failure. So what, what I was talking about is, you know, what does it mean to me as a person if I fail? Um, obviously, I need to survive the failure, which is, I think, what yeah. you're getting at now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so to answer your question, uh, you know, the things that... Um, because I think this is a, an important point, really. And, and again, it, I, I've been asked before, you know, do I think my military training has helped me? And the answer is yes, absolutely, it, it, in planning for the road. Um, you know, you, you focus on, when it comes to, um, you know, how am I going to do this? You focus on all of the, all of the things that, I have focused on all of the things that could cause me to fail. So single points of failure for ocean rows are very often um, failure of steering because the rudders are on the back of the boat. They get smashed by these huge waves and they get ripped off. Um, another one is my water maker. I, I, I can carry enough bottled water and I do carry fresh bottled water and that's for emergency to tide me over. If I lose my main water maker, I'll have enough supplies just to be, to be picked up by a passing ship. Um, but... If, if I'm still saying, if I'm only halfway across and I lose my main water maker, I'm unlikely to be able to carry on because I need water. It's as simple as that. And, and I'm exercising. I'm going to be rowing for, you know, eight, 10, sometimes 12 hours a day. Um, so what I've done is, and this is, I just think this is very, very military. You just focus on all of the things that could cause you to fail. And you're just planning contingencies for all of them. So the water maker, I've been to um, a guy in Western Supermare who is uh, Mr. Watermaker for Ocean Rowing Boats in the UK. And I've spent a, a whole morning or, or most of a day with him going through fault finding. I'm carrying spares. Um, I've got a brand new water maker. 
Uh, so it's not an old thing that we've reconditioned. It's brand new. So I, I've got mitigation there. And I've also got satellite telephones and reach back to him. So any problems that I have that I can't suss out or figure out, I'll be on the phone to him and he can help me. And, you know, I've ensured that I've got as many spares as is realistic uh, and the tools to perform whatever it is that I might need to do. Steering, I've completely, massively over-engineered the back of my boat. Um, it, it's um, compared to what it was, it's, it's too difficult to try and explain, you know, without pictures to, to explain to people what I've done to it. But um, it's just suffice to say it's much, much stronger um, than it was. Um, so I, I've, I've also put hydraulic steering on there and I've got an autopilot. So if the autopilot fails, I can go back to manual hydraulic steering. If the manual hydraulic steering fails, I can disconnect the ram and I can go to what would be an old fashioned, um, and it's literally two steering lines and, and cam cleats where you lock, mm -hmm. you set the rudder on the bearing you want and lock it off. So I've got three levels of steering um, of contingency um, on that. I've got life rafts, uh, communications, uh, I've got a BGAM satellite, I've got uh, two Garmin inreaches, both satellite, I've got two satellite telephones. So there's what, that's five means of satellite communication, all at different levels, um, and a lot of it in grab bags. So there's one of everything in a grab bag, which will go with me in the life raft. So, uh, you know, I'm, hope, I'm hoping what I'm doing is painting a picture of uh, what, what would be quite a complicated um, series of contingency plans that go from, if everything's nice and the sun's shining, because nearly everything depends on power, with everything working and I'm rowing along in a calm sea, to me being turned upside down and needing to get into my life raft, I should still be able to effect a rescue. And it'll be scary, don't get me wrong, uh, but the book will be better at the end of it. So, I mean, I've spent like 14 months constantly second guessing um, what might go wrong. So, and, and putting contingencies in place. So again, this so th this is important. This is really important for, for people to understand. So earlier on in the conversation yesterday, um, you you were talking about the lack of physical preparation that you've been able to put in um, to the point you described it as well. I've I've done no physical preparation for this, which could blow people's minds. I, I understand you leaning on your attributes that you don't have to be a physical specimen Olympic rower to complete this. You just have to be an outlier. Let's just say that, right? So you've got to, you've got to fancy the challenge to begin with. And so you're, you're doing that. Some people may listen and that, that's pretty reckless. There's no way I would do that. Now, when it comes to the planning that you have been able to put into control, your control, you have been incredibly thorough and detailed. Right. And, and I'm hearing multiple contingencies for every single eventuality. So some people saying, what if this happens? That's what sounds really scary. What you, you thought about all of these things and put in as many yeah. things in place as you can. There's always going to be something. This is why we all do eventually walk outside the front of our house. There's always something that could happen if you're going to bubble yeah. wrap yourself. But you've done everything you can. One thing that interests me, and we, and again, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but you, you, uh, you mentioned just before we started recording again that you, you know, because I, I put a question out on social media. The first quite the first answer I got was, why is he so good looking? And I was like, oh, that's suspicious. Who's that? And I and well, it turns out it was you. And uh, that was quite early. That was quite early. You get that? Yeah. <laughs> it, it was quite early. And I'm looking at my watch going, well, that's really early. So obviously you're up early than you're up early than you should be. And I asked you that question before we started talking. You said, I'm just not sleeping very well at the minute because you you know you've you're yeah, getting off to sleep and you've got a knot in your stomach and mate, that's understandable you've done as much planning as you can but how are you dealing with this internal pressure now to actually go and get started this gap before you start now um, how am i dealing with it um the, the time's not particularly well if i'm honest with you um I, you know I, I you're right I, i've got this permanent knot in my stomach um I believe uh, fear and excitement are very, very similar. It's a very blurred line between those two emotions. Um, you know, w one is exactly what it says on the tin. It's exciting, you know, and a rough sea in a small boat to a point will be exciting. Yeah. Um, 
And then if those seas continue to grow, it's going to bridge across into fear. Uh, and, and then I'm just going to be hanging on and I'm going to be terrified. There, there's an element of... Once I'm in that situation, because I think about this a lot, when I'm in that situation, there is nothing I can do to get out of it. Nothing at all. Um, yes, I've got beacons that I can pull, uh, you know, EPIRBs, PLBs, personal locator beacons. Sorry, an, an EPIRB is a, um, an emergency uh, distress beacon. So you press a button on it and it bounces off satellite and goes to... Um, Falmouth Coast Guard. I, I don't know if I explained that earlier yesterday. That's Sorry, guys. No, that's fine. I can't remember. And a, and a PLB is just a smaller version. It just means that you can clip it to your belt. An EPIRB is quite big and it stays with a boat and a PLB. So I can pull these things uh, and, and get a signal to say I need help in this storm. But it's going to take uh, Falmouth Coast Guard a certain amount of time to locate the nearest passing, passing ship. And then they'll come to my aid. And then you've got to remember that I'm a, a, a seven and a half meter long rowing boat that sits half a meter above the waterline, um, trying to get up the side of a, what could be a, a huge container ship or, or, or passenger ferry. Um, and and in, a, in a big sea, that's where your problems start. Uh, you know, so um, th there's an element of go going back to the fear thing. That there's just nothing I can do to control it. It is just pure survival. There, there is nothing that I can do physically to, or mentally to make the process of getting off that ocean rowboat and trying to climb up a Jacob's ladder or a scramble net on the side of a ferry. There's nothing I can do. So it's almost like there's no point worrying about that. Um, so I, I just try and park it. When I think about that, it scares me. And I think, well, I'm just either going to survive that or I'm not. And, and it's just very matter of fact. I, I, I can't. No, you are. You are. Uh, there's, there is a... there's no process or there's nothing that I can say, well, I can do this and I can, you know, the, the, I just have to accept that that is a possibility. No, I, and I, I hear what you're saying and I, I can relate to it in, in, in a number of ways. And I, and I think what I've spoken to other people about in the past is you, you've practiced this and this is how you've got good at it. So you, you're recognizing that like initially what you said is, Fear and excitement are very similar. Bang on, they're, they're, they're almost, your body doesn't hardly know the difference. And when you're afraid, most people would go, oh, don't like this, I'm gonna take myself out of this situation. What you've done from 15 years old, trying to jump out of airplanes, probably sooner, you know, um, you've taught yourself that that horrible feeling you get, you can do something with that. And actually the reality afterwards is never as bad. So you've had spent a lifetime now, you know, did you say you're, you're 40, just turned 49, is that right? I'm 49. Hopefully, I'll be having my 49th birthday in the first couple of weeks of see. Yeah. Uh, middle of June is my birthday. Brilliant. So you're you're nearly 49, and you've had a full life of of you know experiences where you've been able to overcome this bit of anxiety for this thing that's too big for you to kind of go against. But go, do you know what? I'm I'm a part of an organisation that just is asking this. I'll do it and see how it. And we we continually do this, don't we? And so we've you've you've had that development. So I, you know, I, I hear that. And now you've come to like, you you recognise it as well. This is me going outside of my comfort zone. People ask all the time, or say all the time, you need to get out of your comfort zone. And, well, this is it. It feels like this, and it's awful, and no one really likes it. And then when you're in it, you go, I don't want to be here. And that's what being outside your comfort zone actually is. And you're you're, you're there now. It, it, that gets banded around so much, doesn't it? Get out yeah. of your comfort zone. It's almost like it's almost like it's in fashion to talk about that and uh, positivity as well. I, I don't massively get off on this overly positive positive outlook on things. You know, I've already said that I've spent fourteen months looking at what might go wrong, but that's my way of um, if I can satisfy myself that the negatives are manageable then it allow me to remain positive and have the self-belief that you know yeah i might just get across uh, uh, and, and if i do then it's absolutely worth it but yeah um, no, I, no i uh I, 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 getting out of your comfort zone is just yeah say it everyone says it but and, and you know do it 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a verb. It. It's a verb, isn't it? It's not a saying. It's not, you need to actually take action against it, which is what you're doing. I, I, I'm the same as you. You've never, we've never shared that before. What you said about, I don't buy into the kind of over positive stuff. And it's like, there is a, there is a definitely a place for positivity. I'm not saying I'm a negative person. I know you're not a negative person. We just don't live in either end of the spectrum, you know, too long. It's like fun things happen. We love it. We enjoy it. Bad things happen. We think about it. We move on. We try revert back to this neutral position it's like things can go wrong right what can i do about it do that bring myself back to negative when you recognize your mind going there bring yourself back to neutral sorry you know that's that's kind of what we're doing here and and people don't recognize that they just spend too long in this negative area and then don't actually know how to enjoy the moments of wow this was good and then then moving on and move you know they're always seeking living in that positive mindset which again i i just don't buy into either mate so no i love that i love that i was talking to um toby uh, yeah. bravery toby yeah. and yeah. um this was in the early days of the row uh, you know i knew I'd, i bought my boat and i said toby i want to put your logo on the nose of the boat and you know try and give um bravery a bit of exposure and at the time I was looking for uh, a name for the, for the campaign, you need, to, you need to brand it as something and label it as something. And I came yeah. up with that NY to UK thing. But one of the things that was suggested was mind over matter. Because, you know, Rock to Recovery is a, is a um, mental health charity. Elements yeah. of what the SBS Association does, obviously they're looking after guys who are suffering with, with mental health issues as well. And, and th- this is why I think Toby's so inspirational. He looked at me and, because um, it goes back to this overly positive thing, uh, you know, mind over matter, my mind over the matter of rowing the North Atlantic. Uh, and I think you'd be pretty arrogant to think that you're, you could be so strong in your head that you're going to beat the North Atlantic. It, the North Atlantic will let me across if it decides it wants to. Yeah. It doesn't matter how much of a person I am. It doesn't matter how much I can squat or bench press uh, or... or, or how long I can row for or whether I can stay awake for 48 hours and and never take a break on the oars. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with Mother Nature allowing me across. So, you know, Toby was saying, you know, your mind, because you can be as well prepared with your kit and in your head as you like, said that the matter in your instance is is the North Atlantic. He said, and you ain't going to overcome that. This is Toby, you know debriefing me because i'd suggested this uh, not debriefing me that's the wrong word um this was toby giving me his opinion and then he turned around to me and he looked at me and he said you know he said i thought i was pretty tough when i went through that door you know in my mind and in my head he said the matter in my case was the bullet that severed severed my spinal cord and mate i nearly lost it i I knew you know and he's absolutely right Uh, uh, and so i didn't call it mind over matter because after that little chat, I realized that it wasn't appropriate in any way, shape, or form. But it reinforced this idea that, you know, this overly positive stuff sometimes, I think, is because you, you, you miss some of the things that might make you stumble or fall along the way if you're just blindly positive. Yeah, I think you have to allocate energy to the things that can stop you, and then it will leave a, 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 a positive way forward. Yeah. You know, I, my my attitude towards will I get across is uh, I've got as good a chance as anyone else. I've, it's as simple as that. I've got as good a chance as anybody else. No, it's so true. You're, you're so humble, Dinga. Uh, and you're also, you know, your experience uh, in, in, with the sea and with the ocean, um, with water is is just coming through. There's no, she's a cruel mistress, is the water. And there's, there's going to be yeah. things absolutely out of your control and i love the fact that you're just parking them where they belong well that that's out of my control i'm not going to dwell on that too much and you know move on what's in what's in your control is you've you've been diligent and you've well prepared for everything so you know i've I've, you know i i understand it and i think what people might be missing in the in looking at the problem from a from a kind of helicopter position is um, well, this is like other people's challenges. People row across all the time and they do, but this is different. You're on your own. So when you stop, you're potentially going backwards, right? So how are you, how are you managing that in your mind with, you know, are you just, what, I know your physical preparedness hasn't been great, but how are you prepared for it kind of to routinely do these daily workouts as such? What, what's your kind of plan? Do you have a plan with regards to that? Um, as regards the routine on the oars, it, uh, 
a big catchphrase that you'll hear when you look at ocean rowing is two on, two off. Um, and that is absolutely true for crews uh, because you can, you can row efficiently and effectively for two hours. After that, you start to tail off physically. You'll start to get tired. Yep. Um, so then the, the, the other half of the crew will come on uh, and take the oars and then you go rest for two hours. And, you know, there's a, an ocean revival crew, ex, uh, oh, sorry, serving Marines, uh, going across and doing a, a North Atlantic row at the same time as me. And absolutely, they'll be on two on, two off. But as a solo, that doesn't particularly work. Um, it, it's Rowing at night is a solo is particularly risky, the risk of being washed off the deck, because you you can't see where the waves are coming from. Um, and if you do get washed off, there's no one to throw you a lifeline and there's no one to turn the boat around and come and pick you up. Um, so it, solos don't particularly like rowing at night. Uh, so, so my routine is going to look something similar to a day in the office. Um, if there's a good moon and if it's relatively calm, I might row for an hour or two before it gets light, break for breakfast, um, break for a morning coffee, break for lunch, probably an hour or two sleep, break in the afternoon, evening meal. Um, and then again, if it's light and if it's calm, I might row for an hour or two after sunset uh, and into the evening. But then I'm drifting. Yeah. Um, so the difference with a solo is, as you've already said, when I'm not rowing, I'm drifting. But it, it, I've got to make an assessment of the conditions. If the, if the swell is from behind, I'll let the boat run. And I might wake up and I'll be a mile or two ahead. If it's uh, the swells against me or the wind is on my nose, I put out uh, what they call a parachute anchor, which is uh, it's a great big. It's about, I think it's 9, 12 feet across. Inflates with water. You throw it in the water and it inflates. And, and obviously the wind blows you back. It goes out on 100 meters of line. Um, and it inflates with water and anchors you to the surface of the water. I'll still go backwards slightly, uh, but it will massively reduce the amount that I go backwards. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll I'll trim the boat when I rest. I'll trim the boat depending on the conditions. I love it how you I um, how you sorry thing. I know how you describe it. Solos don't like to um, row at night, and you you're not even describing yourself as a solo. Uh, rowing you're, it's other people other people that solo i don't solo how, like genuinely someone asked me how how much um how much of ocean rowing have you done up to this point like and i know physically training wise it's not but so how many times have you rowed long distances on a on this boat um i've logged about 120 hours rowing it um you know and, and most of those rows i would have liked it to have been much much more than that that's about the bare minimum that i was comfortable with Yep. So uh, it, I, I mentioned the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge um, when we were chatting yesterday. Um, I think, I believe I'm right in saying, uh, and I'm happy to be corrected if I've got this slightly wrong, I think they have to have 120 hours on the boat and uh, spent at least one night on the boat. So I've used their rules as the basis for my preparation. So I, was, I wanted 120 hours and I got it by the skin of my teeth. Yeah. Um, the problem was, as I got my boat finished and ready for the water, and this is this is classic, the problems that I've had. Um, I got the boat back from the, the guys that were helping me. Um, so I was at a, a time where I could then tow it down. I was, I was doing all my training rows out of Portland. Um, and two days later, we went into lockdown. The last lockdown, it was um, end of November, early December, wasn't it? The last one. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, yeah. And, uh, I, and so... I, I, you know, I've not rowed my ocean rowing boat at all at this point. Uh, you know, and I needed to have it in a shipping container come uh, middle of March. Uh, and I'm like, so I was on the phone. I was basically pleading my case to the Coast Guard and, and um, Portland Harbour Master saying, look, this is the training that I've done. I've done my sea survival. I've done my comms. I've got all this kit on board. I need to do this thing. I'm raising money for charity. Um uh, and they didn't particularly like it, but they did eventually say, well, look, as far as I'm concerned, we could clash you as a professional skipper. And that's what allowed me to continue to train. Um, so um, I could only row during daylight hours, and I was doing between 12 and 16 nautical miles during those daylight hours. So I'd get up at Ocrax Farrah, be in the water for, um, you know, don't forget this was January, so it's freezing cold. Um, uh, and, and dark nights. So by seven o'clock, half past seven, I was rowing out of Portland Harbour, and I'd come back in at last light. Yeah, Mate, is um is is the isolation 
potentially three months plus on your own? Is the isolation a concern for you? Is that something you've thought about? Um, it's definitely something that I'm, I've thought about, yes. Uh, some people have asked me, you know, am I engaging with psychologists to come up with coping mechanisms? Uh, and be, because COVID has played um, such a role in my prep, even if I'd wanted to, I don't think I would have had the time, uh, you know. But actually, I, I want to see whether I can do this on my own merits. I want to... I don't want to be referring to a framework of ideas that somebody else has given to me in my times of need. I want to try and do do it with my own framework and in my own head. Uh, so yes, I've thought about it. Um, I mean, I'm boring, so and I've got to put up with myself on this boat for, um, like you say, between three and four months. So it, yes, I've thought about it. No, I don't know if I can cope with it. And that's all part of the curiosity for me. Uh, I, I, I don't think I can give you a much better answer than that, Gaz. It, no, it's, that's a great answer. It's part, it's part of the challenge for me. It, it's yeah. part of it. Yeah. Um, no. I, I, did, I did some walking. I, I, did, um, I, I have had element, extended periods of solitude. Uh, in 2017, I walked all the Monroes in Scotland. Yeah, I heard that. Uh, I heard that. So, 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 so on the back of my um, four years up in, in 4-5 Commando, um, you know, we'd go and do winter training. And, and I absolutely adore the mountains up in Scotland. And, and, and when I was drafted away, I, I, I've said for years, one day I'm going to go back and do them on roads. And I did. I did them in one go. It took me five months. But there, there were days there. There were like four, five, six days where I wouldn't see a soul. I was living in my camper van. I'd get up and do a day walk. I'd bag a few summits, go back to my van, drive to the start of the next day, drive out. And sometimes, especially in the bad weather, I wouldn't see a soul. Um, and things did and, and start to happen to my mind. Um, and I'm expecting that, but to a much greater extent on the road. Um, and, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, some days I'd set off and I'd be in a happy place and, and my head would be full of memories. You, you can remember a lot more about your life than you think you can. Um, and when you have time to, to where there's no external pressure, all I had to do was check my, my nav every now and again. Um, and, and if it was a clear day, sometimes the navigation was particularly easy. You could see what you were going up and you'd walk to the top and then walk back down again. Um, so some days I'd be reflecting on happy times and other days, and it happened a couple of times where I was really quite down. Um, and I started thinking about the, the, the sad things in my life and we've all got them, you know, in my life, yeah. no, no better or no worse than anybody else's. Everybody has the things that make them happy and everybody has the things that make them sad. And there's two or three days I can remember where I just, almost walked for most of the day with, with, you know, with a tear rolling down my cheek. And, and I, I came to the point where I just thought, just let it happen. You know, just, just, just go with the flow, you know, and I checked me now and I walked up and down the hill and then the next day I'd get out and I'd be in a, in a happy place again. Um, so, I mean, this was, I'd have three or four days where I wouldn't see anybody and then I had to get water from my camper van and I need a food resupply. So I'd be back into the nearest town and, and I'd get interaction again. But, with the row, I'm not going to get that. So I think I'm going to have elements of that, but on a much bigger scale. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear that. I hear that. And with regards, we've spoken a little bit about fear um, because there's, you know, you've thought about the isolation. You don't know. So we don't spend too much time thinking about it. And it will do, you trust yourself to be able to deal with it when it comes. Otherwise, you wouldn't start right. So, so with regards to, the event kind of two questions really this like what is your biggest fear what what's the biggest fear that's hanging over you right now um, mate, i'm terrified of open water <laughs> <laughs> true yeah um so every I don't know how often I'm going to have to do this because the water is much colder in the North Atlantic. But if when you listen to the experience of uh, the Mid-Atlantic rowers, like I say, it's a, a lot more people go Mid-Atlantic. Every two weeks, I have to go over the side 
and scrape the barnacles. You get these things called gooseneck barnacles that attach themselves to the hull of your boat. When you get enough of them on there, you're dragging them through the water. They're hitchhikers. Um, and you, you go down and you scrape. You've got to go over the side, mask and snorkel, and a, you know, like an ice scraper. Um, and you scrape these barnacles off, and you, you'll hear them say that they get an extra quarter of a knot of boat speed back. Um, mm. Well, if you're only rowing at two knots, yeah, a huge. quarter of a knot is 25% of your boat speed. Huge. Now, it won't be as often as that for me um, because um, the water's a lot colder. But I'm going to have to go over the side. Uh, and mate, I, I was like 14 years old when I watched yours. Yeah. It's as simple as that. I know where it came from. I'm yeah, one of same. those generations same. of people. I sat yeah. and bit a hole in my finger as a young lad watching like this, and I, 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 I gnawed uh, a hole in my finger watching jaws. It terrified me. And I've had this ridiculous fear of open water ever since. And it doesn't make any sense. I was a ship diver in the Marines. So, uh, you know, I've been in and out of, of, of the ocean and, and dived beneath ships and stuff uh, as a ship's diver. If somebody is next to me in the water, that fear is manageable. If at any point, and this is as ridiculous as when you finish your dive and you're coming up alongside the, you know, the, 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 the you know, your, your safety boat, I would always grab hold of the guys that were helping and make sure I was the first one out the water. Because I didn't want my legs hanging in the water and be the only one in the water. It's ridiculous. It, it's pathetic and it's embarrassing admitting it. But um, it's, it's the truth. It, it's the know, absolute truth the, of the matter. The eight, the eighties, the eighties Hollywood movies have got a lot to answer for. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I'm exactly the same. I'm petrified of sharks. I tell myself it's a healthy yeah. fear, but sometimes it is absolutely <laughs> incapacitated me. I've got a, I've got an article on the website where I've written about my fear of sharks. It absolutely incapacitated me. Um, I wanted to be a pilot too, and I've got an infatuation with tight white t-shirts. Um, but that's from Top Gun. Um, <laughs> And, and finally, I, I joined the military because of Rambo, probably, or Commando, <clears throat> more likely. So, yeah, Hollywood's got a lot to answer for. Unfortunately, yeah. you know, real world isn't Hollywood. And, you know, we're going to we're going to see snippets, I'm sure, on social media. I'm sure of what you're about to do. And, you know, <clears throat> genuinely, mate, it inspires me to think about, well, we can all continue to do so, so much more. You know, I, I feel lucky in some ways that I've had a career that has enabled me to have certain experiences I chose to kind of put myself there but in the last two years I've, I've not done much I like to get up the hills with the kids and, and, and Karen and my wife but we don't do an awful lot outside that lockdown's not helped that of course but you know listening to friends to yourself and other people that I'm, I'm able to tap into of the things that they're able to do and still do you know it is inspiring so I know you're in you know, you're inspiring me so you, you you absolutely will be inspiring others how can people that are listening that are inspired by it Dina how can they get involved and help out and and try and raise some money for some well-needed causes um yeah, so I, I'm, I'm going out on social media. I've never been on social media before in my life until I bought my boat, and um, and I decided I was going to raise money for charity. So when I started speaking to the charities, they're like, well, you have to have a social media campaign. Um, so if they go to NY, to UK, Solo Row, and it's a number two, it's a number yep. two, NY to UK, Solo Row, They'll find me on um, Facebook. They'll find me on Instagram uh, and Twitter. They're all the same. And if you smack .co.uk on the end, you will find my website. And there's links to the website anyway from all the socials. We'll stick uh, it. We'll stick it uh, in this as well. Anyone listening will be able to yeah. find it on the on all the links. Uh, and on the on the website, there will be a link to my tracking page, so you can laugh at me going backwards. Um, that should update every hour. Um, so that's on the uh, um, on on the homepage of the website. Um, and also the, the, the fundraising link. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a Virgin Money Giving page. And so if they want to help, I mean, I have all the equipment that I need. Um, assuming I can get out on the weather and I don't have to pay for this hotel room much longer because it's crucifying me <laughs> and my money's running out fairly rapidly. Uh, so long as I get out on the weather in the next few days, I, you know, my, my, my attempt is underway. So financially, I've, I've obviously had what I need. So really, if they want to help, a donation to the charity would be would be fantastic brilliant um i did have a question around finances someone you know you mentioned earlier on that you've, you've funded this with your life life savings and you know that'll inspire people to maybe do a little bit more but 
you know, has there been any other has sponsorship come easy? Is it something you've really struggled with or? Um, so my original plan when I first started hatching this idea, uh, Gaz, was to buy a boat, load it with food, ship it to New York and row across. I wasn't going to tell anybody other than, you know, the immediate people around me, uh, yeah. you know, my immediate friends that I see yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I was just going to just going to go and have a go and tell no one. I'm not doing it for any other reason um, other than that personal curiosity. And then I started to think it's not actually right to do something of that magnitude and not raise money for charity. Um, and then the pandemic kicked in and, it, and it's, it, you know, a lot of people are struggling. So these charities do need help. Um, then I came up with the idea that I'd get to the halfway point. Uh, you asked me about my biggest fears. I, I, another fear I've got, in all seriousness, is a lame attempt. A really lame attempt, because I have got a bit of uh, publicity now. I think there's about thirteen or 14,000 pounds in the charity pot. Now, there was a guy that tried to do this route last year, and within 24 hours, he got washed up on Long Island Beach. Yeah. because of the tides and the winds. Um, mm. and, and I'm not knocking him. It's a very, very difficult place to get out of in, a, in an ocean rowing boat that weighs nearly a ton. Um, you're at the mercy of the elements. It's a busy shipping lane, uh, and the tides rip, and the weather is unpredictable and variable. So, um, it, you know, I've got a lot of my own money invested in this, and uh, one of my biggest fears is you know, going two days down the coast and just getting smashed by southerlies because that will push me north and I'll be on the beach and and, and that will be the end of it. Yeah. So, can, um, is there any chance it, you can any chance you can bungee on to the other team, the Royal Marine team that are leaving the same time? Is that an opportunity? They, they keep saying that. Let us know if you want to tow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. No, um, and what do they think of you? What they, have you? You must have had a chat with them. What do they think of what you're doing? Obviously, they're doing it as a, as a four four man team. They, yeah, they were livid with me. They were absolutely fuming. I did a podcast over here with a guy called um, Jack Carr. Um, and on that podcast, I, I was telling the story of Lee Spencer, who's he's a, an ex Royal Marine, an amputee. I don't know if you know Lee. He goes under the, under the name the Rowing Marine. And I had a, a, a day long chat with Lee very early in my preparation. Um, and he did it, the row as a four. And he said to me, when he finished, he just felt like he'd only rode a quarter of it. Yeah. <laughs> so he very quickly went back and um, he, he started planning his solo row. And he's now a world, he's broken the able-bodied world record, wow. uh, which is which is quite something as an amputee. Um, wow. So I was telling, I was saying this on this podcast. And uh, so, so the Ocean Revival crew were fuming. They're like, well, we're just going to go and row a quarter of an ocean each. <laughs> So I've been getting nothing but nothing but grief off them yeah. since that it went public. Yeah, um, they're they're their anyway. assistance, their assistance if you need it in a few days' time, Dinger. That's gone now. Yeah. That's gone. Yeah. 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 I've missed a bit of your question. You asked me something about money. You asked me something about finances, didn't you? And I don't think I addressed it. Do you no, remember just what it was? whether just whether sponsorship had been easy to yeah. come by. Yeah, so I, I had a I had a work contract for the middle of last year. Um so my my initial aim was to self-fund the whole thing because I wanted to own the failure financially as well as the success. I don't know if you can get a feel of why that would be. I didn't feel comfortable taking other people's money, knowing that I was doing such a difficult route, knowing that the chances of failure were quite high statistically. So I just wanted it to be mine. Uh, you know, and it would also be, I would own the success as well, um, you know, which would be equally as sweet. Um, so I wanted to own the whole thing, um, but I lost this work contract. It left, left me with uh, a, a 15,000 pound shortfall in my finances. Um, and the answer to your question is because of the pandemic, none of the big corporations were interested. Nobody. Um, I, I wrote to uh, Audible, you know, the audio books. Yes. Um, yes. Which is backed by, is that backed by Amazon, Amazon or Google? They're connected, sure. they're connected to Amazon. I know that. Yeah. Yeah, so I wrote to them and I said, look, you know, I'm I'm doing an ocean row. I'm going to be by myself for four months. Um, there's no better advert for audiobooks. I wrote them this piece, you know, and I said, would you support me with some audiobooks? And they sent me three free um, audiobooks. <laughs> sent me codes and said, yeah, 
we'd love to support you. Can yeah. you send us all of your PR material, all of your videos, all of your photographs, um, and we'll give you <laughs> three, three credits, which is worth about 15 quid. You know, and, and you, know, you think of the bumper year that Amazon has had in the pandemic, where people have just been sat at home just spending their furlough money. And I was, I was livid. I was, I was insulted <laughs> by it, and I've not, I've not cashed them in. I was like, I'm not going to pay for them. I love that. I love that. Jeff Bezos, are you listening? Have you heard, <laughs> you heard the reality of your organization? No, mate, yeah. I, I, I love that. And also your response, which I mean, I love, you know, how, you know, screw you, audiobook. I'm going to listen to my iPod and I'm just going to take some tunes. Some, uh, yeah, I love it, mate. Um, uh, no, I expected that the sort of financial challenges were there. And because just at the time, it's the period of time that we're in. So no fair play to you. I mean, I just encourage as many people as possible to, to help out. Um, I know, and again, I know you know this, Dinger, that it's difficult times for a lot of people, a lot of uncertainty out there. But, you know, this is a cause. It, you, everyone can hear it on the podcast. This isn't for Dinger. Well, there is, there's, there's the things that you're doing that you're really looking forward to. But you've made it much more... Uh, selfless and you realize that there's an opportunity to raise money for charity here you could have just done it in the cover of darkness almost and just got it cracked my just original got it. Plan, it was yeah. that was and, my original plan was just to disappear and i have actually got a so i've got so much respect for that also but the fact that you've turned it around now into kind of a, a charity op, a charitable opportunity again i've got a, i've got so much respect for that so i just implore people to 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 dig a little bit deeper than they think they can and just maybe uh, reach out to Dinger and the support crew that will be kind of running his social media, I'm sure, over the next few months and and just try and uh, help out in whatever way. Because, um, you know, I'll be I'll be watching keen, keenly, mate. I'll be supporting in whatever way I can, both financially and uh, and through, again, whatever means that we can come up with. But, uh, yeah, thoroughly looking forward to watching it happen. Um um, thoroughly excited and scared for you and uh so again i, I wait with uh bated breath on all your regular updates and the team's updates whether that's silver fox or um anybody else that might be talking to us but yeah if you've got any kind of final words for anyone listening to me you know for me with this row this has been brewing in, 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 in one of my section corporals did an ocean row in about 2000 um that's where the original seed was sown that's when i first heard that you could row an ocean so and then that, that sense of wanting to do it is built. And, and for me, it was, it would have been sad if I hadn't tried. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not out here to try and be inspirational. That's not, again, one of my goals. If, if, I, if people find me inspirational, then that's very flattering. But uh, it's not one of my goals to inspire people. But if somebody sat there on this idea that they want to go and do something, then just have a go. You know, they just you've got nothing to lose. What are the consequences if you try and fail? Probably nowhere near as bad as you think. Probably the same as me, a ribbon down the pub. So long as I survive it, it'll be a ribbon down the pub. You know, mm -hmm. but my, my life is already richer for the whole process. You know, the, just the journey I've had and the hurdles I've had yeah. just to get the boat to New York and myself to New York. Yeah. Um, my life's already, you know, a, a richer um, for, for, the, for the experience. So, 100%. Yeah, just have a go. Yeah, Have a go. I, I love that, thing. I'm absolutely certain, regardless of the outcome, there'll be no rippings down the pub because you're, you're biting off one of the biggest challenges I've ever heard. And uh, I've got a huge amount of respect. Um, the, the sea is the most merciless of opponents. Um, I know you know that. And if you can master your craft there, then you, you can genuinely master it anywhere. So I, I, I look forward to seeing where this goes and I, I hope to see you on the other side, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Dinger. Thanks.